Hi, I'm Chashang Bhargav and you're listening to Three Things, the Indian Express news show. In this episode, we talk about the Mumbai police busting an international loan app scam. We also talk about the Madras High Court telling the Tamil Nadu government to include the pictures of the Prime Minister and the President in some recent advertisements. But first, we talk about the Indian economy. Last week, the International Monetary Fund or the IMF downgraded India's GDP projection for the current and the next year, essentially saying that India's GDP will grow at a slower rate than its previous estimations. The international financial institution said that it expects India to grow at 7.4% in the current year and 6.1% in the next. This is noteworthy because the way a country's GDP grows affects how many people are getting employed, how businesses are doing, and how the financial well-being of its population is improving. Now, despite the IMF downgrading India's GDP projection, the news had both negative and positive reactions. In this segment, we speak to Udit Mishra, who writes on the economy for the paper, about these reactions and what the IMF projections mean. Udit, the IMF made these projections as part of its World Economic Outlook. Could you first talk about what the World Economic Outlook usually tells us? So, you know, every year IMF, which is an organization which tracks globally the economies across the world, it comes out with two World Economic Outlooks. These are released in April and October. And then in between these periods, it also provides updates to these World Economic Outlooks just tweaking what has happened and often between you know within three months things can change and the reason why imf world economic outlook is good is because you can in one place get a sense of what's happening to the global economy where are the pain and pressure points which economies are doing well and why and it's of great value in that sense so what we have received last week is the july update on the world economic outlook and it has updated its stance or its projections for growth and other things from the April World Economic Outlook. Right, and in this update, the IMF has downgraded India's GDP projection for the current year and the next year. And it said the expectations are that India will grow at 7.4% in the current year and 6.1% in the next year. Is this something that economists were expecting? Yes, absolutely. At one level, what the IMF has done in terms of downgrading India's GDP is just bringing it in line with what most other economists have been saying. RBI's own projection for growth uh, this year is 7.2. IMF in April thought that it would be much higher. The projection was 8.2. And in January, it thought it would be 9% for the current financial year. Now, it has in the successive uh, world economic outlooks, rolled it back. And so at one level, this is not surprising. This is very much in line with what's happening. And it has not just downgraded India's growth outlook. It has done that for the rest of the world also. The global output has been dialed back by 40 basis points. And so same for advanced economies also and for other emerging markets also. Okay, and after IMF's update, you write that there were mixed reactions to this news. Like some people were actually happy that despite the projections being downgraded, India is still doing a lot better than other economies in the world. So is that really the case? Is India faring better than other economies right now? Absolutely. In terms of GDP growth rate, India really stands out because, um, you know, often small countries can have very sharp growth rates. But India is not a small country. It's a huge economy. And for it to continue to grow at 8.7, we grew in last financial year. And for us to grow at 7.4 or 7.2 or something like that, this year would be a very credible achievement. So at one level, it does show that India is one of the outliers, if anything, when the rest of the world, especially developed world, is sort of struggling with growth slowdown, even dealing with recession, as we've seen in US, and many other economies also struggling in a similar manner, say for China, India's growth rate, that percentage improvement is very commendable. And Udit, why has that been possible for India? Why has India done better, at least in terms of its GDP growth rate? 
So one reason why India has been doing well is also because of the low base effect. India was one of the worst hit when the COVID pandemic happened. So in terms of growth rates, it shows a much bigger jump. And this is something that I've highlighted in number of my pieces that when times are going through massive upheaval, it is better not to look at growth rates. And I give an example that you take the GDP of a country at 100, reduce it by 25% in one year, and then increase it by 25% in the next year. And then after two years, the GDP would be only 93.75, which is considerably lower than the 100 that you started off with. So percentage changes don't often do justice in times when there are massive surges up and down. It is always better to look at the absolute value of GDP in those phases. And that is what is happening with India's case also. We are showing a massive jump in percentage. But in reality, in absolute terms, the GDP or the state of the economy may not be as rosy as the percentage change shows. Okay, and in that sense, the other reaction to this news makes sense because one of the things that people are focusing on is not that India is faring better than other countries, but the fact that India's GDP growth is now expected to slow down even further, right? From 7.4% to 6.1%. Yes, so that is the other way to look at it. One is to look at obviously the absolute amount of GDP and see that issue. But even within GDP growth rates, one has to look at the trajectory of what is happening to India's GDP growth rate. From 87 last year to 7.4 or 7.2 now to 6.1 next year. In fact, if you look at some other estimates, they differ quite dramatically on the lower side. Say Namura for next year expects India to grow at just 4.7%. So you have to see it in the context of what was the state of India's economy going into the pandemic. We grew at just, in fact, less than 4%, 3.7% in the year before the pandemic, 2019-20. And so coming out of the pandemic, while we might see a huge jump in terms of the percentage change, that percentage change will finally catch up with the real economy. And Udit, right now we are just talking about things in terms of numbers and percentages. 7.4% and 6.1%, which can be hard to wrap one's head around because it's not apparent what these numbers actually mean for people, like what they mean for someone looking to get a job or a higher pay. So could you just ground these figures and explain to listeners what it could mean for them? Yeah, so it's very important to understand that GDP as a measure is a monetary measure. It's a value measure. It looks at how much the GDP went up in money terms. But when GDP goes up in money terms, doesn't necessarily mean that that prosperity is equally divided. And we've seen in India that we've had a K-shaped recovery, which is to say that certain sectors, the more formal organized sectors have done much better coming out of the pandemic. They've in fact even benefited. And many other sectors, say the rural or the MSME, the small businesses have actually got ruined. And it doesn't always get captured in GDP because if one person makes a lot of money, one person becomes much richer by billions of dollars, then it papers over the misery of a, another 100 million people actually losing their livelihood. So if you look at the US economy, which has gone into a technical recession for past two quarters, the first two quarters of 2022, it has contracted. And yet their unemployment rate is at a 50 year low, which is to say that they have more than enough jobs for almost every unemployed person. There are two vacancies in the economy. Now, if you just look at employment, because that has been a massive concern over the past five, six years in India, if you just look at unemployment, what's happening to India, and last year we grew at 8.7, so that's a very handsome number, roughly 9% growth. And if you look at what happened to unemployment or employment demand in FY22, we find that Narega jobs, which is a measure of how well the rural economy or the people in rural India are doing, they have climbed up massively over the pre-COVID number. So it is understandable that obviously Narega demand went up in the COVID year, that is FY21. But the fact is that even when we recovered and grew at 9% in that year, FY22, 
द नरेगा डिमांड रिमेन ऑलमोस्ट यू नो थर्टी फोर्टी फिफ्टी परसेंट अब द प्री कोविड टाइम विच इज टू से दैट इन रूरल इंडिया पीपल आर नॉट गेटिंग जॉब्स और रूरल फोक्स कमिंग इन टू सिटीज आर नॉट गेटिंग जॉब्स एंड दे आर गोइंग बैक टू दिस स्कीम विच गिव गारंटीड जॉब्स फॉर अ मिनिमम हंड्रेड डेज दैट काइंड ऑफ अ थिंग ओके सो इवन दो वी हैड नाइन परसेंट ग्रोथ दैट डेंट मीन दैट वी टूक केयर ऑफ आर अनएम्प्लॉयमेंट प्रॉब्लम but the example of narega you gave concerns the rural sector but does that at least mean that people in the urban sector got employment so now in that regard what we found is that bank of baroda recently did a sort of a survey of 675 companies they looked at the annual reports of these companies for the last financial year across 30 sectors and they said let's see who's created how many jobs and it found that overall over these 32 sectors that they looked at the total number of job creation was 10.2% or something you know which was quite impressive but if one was to remove only three sectors it finance and banking then the overall jobs growth in the year when we had 9% growth fell below 2% which is to say that even the organized sector the so called upper end of the k shaped recovery has a k within it has a massive area where sectors upon sectors are not creating jobs you know of the 34 or 32 sectors that bank of baroda looked 14 sectors actually had a decline in jobs the total number of employment actually fell so the point being that it is one thing to say that 9% growth happened in last year or 7% is happening today and in a global context this number looks rosier than everybody else and that is factually correct but in india's context where there's mass poverty there's mass unemployment even a 7% or 8% or 9% growth often is consistent with massive unemployment a lot of people actually losing jobs so our viewers readers and listeners should understand that you know 9% in india or 8% in india may not always be necessarily as such a harbinger of prosperity as a 9% in us would be or a even a 4% in us would be even in their recession they are better than what we are in our 9% growth or a higher gdp projection could be a harbinger of prosperity but only for a certain sector i suppose precisely precisely this is a very important point to understand that you can have a gdp growth because that's an aggregate measure but the inequality may be increasing in all measures and we've done several stories on this poverty is increasing unemployment is increasing inequalities are increasing and that only shows that yes on the aggregate gdp is growing but you know one person in the room might be getting 50 times the income or profit but 50 other might be actually losing jobs or might be getting more impoverished and that cannot be a sustainable model for any country this big and next we talk about a scam last week the cyber police of the mumbai crime branch busted an international loan app fraud the gang that was running this racket consisted of at least 14 people and together managed to defraud hundreds of people to the tune of over 300 crore rupees in this segment indian express's jay prakash naidu who broke the story joins us to talk about how the gang operated and what the police have found out Jeprakash the loan app scams have become quite prevalent lately so could you first talk about how they usually function so this uh, loan app frauds it's an organized crime and it basically targets people who are in urgent need of money and you know they are looking for quick loans without giving much of the documents without much of the you know paperwork so what these people do is they will uh, send you a link on your message or on whatsapp or they will put up links on facebook and youtube asking people to apply for very easy loans where you know you don't have to do a lot of paperwork and once you download these apps you get lured by it and that you know that you're going to get this urgent loan you download the apps and you end up giving access of your contact list and your gallery to them and then these people will not give you the promised loan they will give you i'll say a few thousand rupees and then within a week or two they will ask you double the amount and then people end up taking the money in a hurry and afterwards even after paying the entire amount these people fraudsters they will make you pay even more so there are people who have taken loans of few thousands and ended up giving few lakhs 
and these people you know how they do it they will harass you because you've already given them access to your contact list and your gallery so they have your personal photos they have every person in your contact list so they will start calling you in numerous times they'll start abusing you they'll start calling you calling people in your contact list and then because they have your photograph they'll start morphing it with obscene photos and obscene videos you know pornographic videos and then they will forward it to your relatives the people your colleagues at office and they basically they will shame you so how many people will you keep explaining because these people start calling you up saying that hey we are getting such messages from people saying that you have taken a loan and we are getting these obscene messages and all so the person comes under pressure okay so after they have access to all your contacts and images they extort money out of you and also sexually harass you by morphing your photos with pornographic images yes yes it's correct that's what they do and how much money do people end up losing through such scams so see this fraudsters target thousands of people right even if you take a loan which is of few thousand rupees you end up you losing few lakhs like there was this particular case there where a person had taken a loans from 10 different apps and they had taken a total loan of 3 lakh so this person ended up giving around 15 lakhs so there are several such cases so the amount goes into crores okay so in this particular scam that the mumbai police busted last week who were the scamsters and did they also operate in a similar fashion so as i was talking earlier it's a well organized crime but the masterminds are said to be chinese nationals and uh, they are operating from abroad they have come to mumbai a few times where they have trained indian nationals and till now the mumbai crime branch has arrested 14 accused in that 14 accused two of them are translators for a chinese language and apart from that the rest of the accused some of them they all have different roles to play some of them are directors of a company some of them did the work of opening up the bank accounts and opening up the fake shell companies these bank accounts and shell companies were required to transfer the ill gotten money and then sending it abroad through cryptocurrency so until now the case is still under investigations it has been 2 months now but in this 2 months the police have said that the cheated amount is at least over 350 crores and there is a lot more to it and how many people did they end up defrauding so in this case the police are saying at least over 1000 people have been targeted by these people they have been operating for the last 4 years and you know the kind of uh, seizure that has been made from them that itself shows the volume of the crime for example over 200 sim cards have been seized from them these 200 sim cards have been obtained on forged documents apart from that these people were having over 360 bank accounts these people were running at least 37 fraudulent loan apps which have been pulled down apart from this 200 more loan apps are under the scanner and they have opened 200 shell companies to siphon the money and the police said that they were using at least 50 cryptocurrency wallets to siphon the money out of the country and they have managed to save few crores of rupees but still around 14 crore rupees they have saved but still the cheated amount is huge and the investigations are on and at least 10 chinese nationals are said to be involved in the crime and jay prakash could you talk about how the police first started investigating this crime and how it first came to their attention so you know the indian express had uh, reported earlier this year that such a loan app scam is going on loan app fraud rather and after that i mean the police were taking it lightly but the entire thing changed for them when a 38 year old man named sandeep koragaukar he was a salesman in maladish he committed suicide in may this year so he was being harassed by this loan app recovery agents they called him over 50 times they morphed his photos and you know they morphed his nude photos and they sent it to people at his office including women colleagues they sent it to people in his locality so they started contacting him so he was under tremendous pressure we in next we spoke to his brother so he said that they were trying to counsel him they even went to the local police stations which registered non cognizable complaint they should have taken a fire and started investigating it maybe he would have felt a bit relieved but then he could not take the pressure and he committed suicide uh, this was in may this year and after this it was that the police realized the gravity of the situation and about 29 cases were given to the mumbai crime branch and they started investigating it and that's how the whole thing was unearthed and you just mentioned that when sandeep had gone to the police they registered a non cognizable complaint could you explain what that means to our listeners see cognizable complaints are firs first information report and non cognizable complaints are where the police does not take cognizance at the most they can call the person against whom the non cognizable complaint has been registered and give him a warning 
if they want to investigate it then they'll have to take permission from the court or there is a particular law that they have to follow to convert a non cognizable complaint into cognizable complaint and usually non cognizable complaints they do not investigate it is mostly when you know there are quarrels in your housing society and a neighbor goes and complain against his own neighbor something of that sort and jay prakash do we know about similar scams that have also been busted recently yeah so recently apart from mumbai police the nepal police have also busted a similar scam and even there many people have been arrested and the mumbai police are in the process of contacting the nepal police to find out if there is a common link for example in the mumbai police case they have not been able to identify who are the accused who are morphing the photographs you know because in every case of a loan app fraud the victims photos have been morphed with some you know obscene photograph and then they send this to the people in the contact list so this particular group of people who do the work of morphing they have not been identified in the mumbai case but in the nepal case it has been identified so the mumbai police will be contacting the nepal police to find out if there's a common link because even there in the nepal case the alleged involvement of some chinese nationals has come to fore so even in this case chinese nationals are wanted so the mumbai police will be checking to see if there are any common links and what advice do the police give to people about how they can avoid getting targeted through such loan app scams see the most important advice that the police have given out is that the people who have already fallen to such uh, loan app frauds they should not succumb to the pressure and should not fall for the extortion tactics they should immediately approach the police and lodge a complaint and the police will guide them as to how to get out of this mess that's one second thing is that the police have appealed to people not to take such uh, loans from these apps and they should approach the banks if they want to take loans and thirdly they should not be downloading any such links through sms and whatsapp and they should never give access to gallery personal photos and contact list on their mobile phone in every case what happens is the victim ends up giving access to his gallery and contact list which are later misused the police have said that they must call on 1930 or they can log into cybercrime.government.in to report any kind of cyber crime including this one and in the end we talk about a recent ruling of the madras high court right now the 44th chess olympiad is going on in chennai and players from around the world are there to participate in the tournament and the city has hundreds of posters advertising the event that have been put up by the state government now recently a petition was filed in the high court regarding these posters and the fact that they only had the photograph of the tamil nadu chief minister mk stalin in them and after hearing the petition the court ordered the state government to include the picture of the prime minister and the president in them in this segment indian express's apurva vishwanath who writes on law for the indian express tells us on what basis the madras high court gave this directive so the madras high court relies on the 2015 judgment of the supreme court which is titled common cause versus union of india and that 2015 judgment dealt with content regulation of government advertisements essentially and laid down certain guidelines on how government advertisements should be placed what they can and cannot contain and many such specifics so what the judgment did was essentially say that only the photographs of the president the prime minister the chief justice of india the chief minister and the governors only these five government officials can be used in advertisements that are issued by the government so the madras high court ruling says that since the supreme court has said that the pictures of the president and the prime minister can be used and the chess olympiad is an international event and only the pictures of the chief minister will not suffice and the tamil nadu government must mandatorily use the pictures of the prime minister and the president but in its ruling does the supreme court mandate that advertisements for international events should have the photos of the president and the prime minister so that's not what the supreme court ruling actually says the ruling is regulating the way the government spends on advertisement the plea was brought in by this ngo called common cause and they basically argued that there is a lot of arbitrary spending on advertisements by the government so this would lead to a wastage of public money and you know using public money for political mileage so they wanted the court to regulate how these advertisements are sort of framed and what can go in in a government advertisement and what cannot so in that the supreme court what it did was essentially set up a three member committee and this three member committee made certain recommendations 
And one of the recommendations that the committee made was you should only have the pictures of those who are absolutely necessary. That would probably be the president or the prime minister or the chief minister and the governor. And beyond that, there is no need for having photographs of every cabinet member or every minister or party functionaries who are in power. So in that context, the Supreme Court modified that recommendation to a fair bit and said that only pictures of the president, prime minister, the chief justice of India, which the court added to that list, would be allowed in government advertisements. But this led to a lot of criticism. And in 2018, you had several states which moved the Supreme Court and sought a review of this judgment. At that point, the Supreme Court said, apart from the president, the prime minister, the chief justice of India, you can also have pictures of the chief minister and the governor. But it doesn't say that it is mandatory that you have a picture of the prime minister if it is a national event, if it's an international event. That's not what the Supreme Court judgment says. But the Madras High Court sort of interprets it that way and says you have to use a picture of the prime minister and the president. Okay, so considering what the Supreme Court ruling did and did not say and how the Madras High Court has interpreted it, what is your biggest takeaway from it? I mean, the political context of this whole issue is hard to miss, where probably the pictures of the prime minister was excluded deliberately as a political move. And members of the BJP had expressed discontent that the prime minister was not visible in any of the advertisements and only chief minister M.K. Stalin was in all the advertisements in Chennai for the event. And when the petitioner moves the court, this context is really hard to miss. But the court sort of says that the state government made some excuses. And also the state government in its response, because political decisions are in its place. But when you have to answer to the court, you know, the state government is sort of trying to make valid, reasonable explanations. And they say that because the presidential elections were underway, we didn't know if we should use the picture of the outgoing president. So we decided not to use them. And for the prime minister, the state again said that the approval from the prime minister's office was delayed and which is why they didn't use those pictures. The high court says that these are excuses taken by the state and they cannot be accepted because this is in the context of national interest that the chess olympiad is happening in Chennai and the pictures of the prime minister must be used. So the application of the ruling, this is not the context in which the petition in the Supreme Court was filed, say, in 2015 and how it actually came about. The issue was really about whether public funds were being wasted on advertisements which could have political mileage. It also raises questions on how much the court can step into the executive turf and guide these policies to such minute details. You are listening to Three Things by the Indian Express. Today's show was written and produced by me, Shashank Bhargav, and was edited and mixed by Suresh Pawar. If you like the show, then do subscribe to us wherever you get your podcasts. You can also recommend the show to someone you think will like it. Share it with a friend or someone in your family. It's the best way for people to get to know about us. You can tweet us at Express Podcasts and write to us at podcast at indianexpress.com.